conforming to God's word for transformation. Let me just pray, and then we begin. Oh Lord, we thank you. We thank you for yet another year that we are starting today. We thank you for yet another year in your word, yet another year enjoying the fellowship of the 3 p.m. service. We thank you for thus far you have brought us. I ask, Lord, that this year we shall see you anew, that this year we shall see you work through each and every one of us um, in ways we had not before that you may use us for your glory as we share the gospel in co gospel conversations, but even as we encourage each other, even as we rebuke each other and, and point each other to Christ. May you be with us today as I share. May your word indeed transform our minds. Um, may you, Lord, be glorified as I share for your name's sake. In Jesus' name. I have prayed. Amen. All right. So, um, this year, the Church of Uganda theme for 2024 is conforming to the truth of God's word and not the patterns of this world. Conforming to the truth of God's word and not the patterns of this world. And it's taken from our text today, Romans chapter 12 verse 1 to 2. So that's what we shall be together as a church of Uganda. We shall be looking at that theme through the year, uh, chewing it, digesting it, understanding it, and applying it. And I'm really, really honored to be starting us off on that journey today as we seek to understand these verses and how we can apply them in our lives, all right? I'll just read through it again, just in case anyone was distracted. It's up on our screens. This is the NIV. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So I'll be taking us through these two verses, um, phrase by phrase, word by word, just so we can understand clearly what God, through Paul, who is the writer of Romans, is asking us to do. And we can start from the very beginning, that first word, therefore. Now, that word already tells us that there's information we don't have. There's information that's coming before these verses that might be or probably is quite important for us to understand what these verses mean, for us to understand what Paul is going to ask us to do. And what comes before these verses? It's really the rest of the book. From chapters 1 to 11, this is chapter 12. So chapters 1 to 11. So in light of Romans chapters 1 to 11, Paul is expecting us to have read through um, chapters 1 to 11, all the way up to 12. Because in light of that, he urges us. He beseeches us. Some versions use beseech. He pleads with us. Other versions use plead. I will add my own version. He begs us. In light of what he has shared from chapter 1 to 11, he pleads with us. And we shall see exactly what he urges us or what he pleads with us to do. But if you notice, he's pleading with his brothers and sisters. So maybe we can start there. He's not pleading with unbelievers. So whatever he's going to ask 
only makes sense to those who are in Christ, to those who are believers. Because apart from that, everything else is just good poetry. Brothers and sisters, fellow believers, Christians, he urges us. Why? It is because of what comes before Romans 12 that he pleads. And you will ask, what comes before Romans 12? Maybe the majority of us have not looked at chapter 1 to 11 in a long time, possibly even ever. So I'll try and give a brief summary, but I would encourage us to go through those chapters ourselves. But chapter 1 to 11, Paul is in simple terms telling us what God has done in light of our sin. He is laying out the gospel of salvation and probably in more detail than he does elsewhere in his writings. If you have ever wondered, what is the gospel? Maybe we say it, we say gospel conversations, but maybe people don't know what the... <laughs> what the gospel is. Maybe they have not had it presented to them. Romans chapter one, chapters 1 to 11 is a good place to start because that's what Paul does. And from chapter 12, where we are today, the first two verses, all the way to the end of the book, he's going to get a bit more practical with the gospel. He's going to show us, now that you have heard what God has done, this is what you are to do. So what you are to do in light of what God has done. So these, these two verses serve as a sort of bridge from what we know, what we should believe about God and what God has done, to what we are to do now that we know what God has done um, and how we are to live in light of that. So that's what that therefore is there for. In a sense, Paul is saying, this is what God has done for you. Therefore, I plead with you, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> but there's something he adds to his plea. I plead with you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. Like I said, maybe you could ask, what is this mercy? What is this, this God's mercy that we should have in view as Paul is pleading to us? Like I said, it's what we see in chapters 1 to 11, the gospel of salvation. And I have a bit of a breakdown here. Again, just in case you have not had the gospel shared Paul breaks it down very well for us in those chapters, and I'll try to also draw out maybe what I thought was important. So in chapter 3, we see that we have all sinned. We have all done things that are displeasing to God. There is no one who is innocent. If you're honest with yourself, you know that about yourself too. There are lies you have told that you have gotten away with, there is probably money you've pocketed that no one knows about. Maybe you did that 10 years ago. <laughs> but there is no one who is innocent. In chapter 6, we see that the punishment that we have earned for our sins is death. Because God is just, you cannot get away with it. That penalty is death. And not just physical death, but eternal death. In chapters 5 and 6, we hear the good news. But Jesus Christ died for us. He paid for the price of our sins. And Jesus' resurrection proves that God accepted Jesus' death as the payment for our sins. And Easter 
When Easter comes, that's what we shall be celebrating. In chapter 10, we see that because of Jesus' death on our behalf, the door has been open. All we have to do is believe in him, trusting his death as the payment for our sins, and we will be saved. Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sins and rescues us from eternal death. Salvation, the forgiveness of sins, is available to anyone, anyone in this room, in this tent, who will trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In chapters 5, and eight, we see that through Jesus Christ, we can have a relationship of peace with God. Our sins are forgiven. We are now able to approach the throne of grace with boldness. Because we have peace with God. And because of Jesus' death on our behalf, we will never be condemned for our sins. And finally, I'm wary to call things my favorite verses, because <laughs> that probably changes according to my mood, maybe my, what I'm dealing with, but I, I really love these two verses. In chapter 8, verse 38 to 39, we see a precious, strength-giving, greatly encouraging promise. Paul writes, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Wow. For me... When my sin overwhelms me, this is a great encouragement. When life is tougher than I expect, this is a great encouragement. Because Paul tries to capture everything. He does his best. Even height nor depth. I guess that means in the skies or in the seas, there is nothing in all creation that will be able to separate us from the love of God. So, in view of all of this, these mercies of God that Paul laid out throughout Romans, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Now we're going to get into the living sacrifice and the offering, but I think it needs to be clear what the motivation is. What is the motivation for us offering our bodies as a living sacrifice to God? Because there are many reasons we quote-unquote do things for God. Sometimes it's fear. Um, we fear condemnation. We fear rejection by God. Many times those are the reasons we even serve. <laughs> um, but Romans 8 has already shown us that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You didn't earn your salvation, so there is nothing you will do that will earn you to keep it. I don't know if that makes sense. Sometimes the motivation is blessings. We want God to bless us more. So we do more for God. Um, so you serve because you anticipate that the more I serve, on the other end, God is keeping his end of the bargain. 
he is getting me a better job, maybe a promotion, or he's getting me a husband. Maybe we even serve to find the husband or the wife. <laughs> ah, no, 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 I'm just meditating on the scriptures. Um, so we do more for God because we expect some sort of reward. Return on investment. I've invested my time, my money. Maybe that's why some of us, we served that camp. We want a better year this year, so how do I do it? Let me start off serving at camp. But God, if you don't, hey, I will not go back for another camp. They will serve themselves. Many times that's the attitude we have. And a big realization to me was that when you make such transactions with God, I realized that all I bring to that transaction is sin. Um, and here, there's only one motivation. We are not getting God to love us more. We have already seen nothing will separate us from the love of God. There's only one motivation Paul gives for why we are to offer our bodies. It is the mercies of God, the gospel, the good news. In light of the good news of what God has done, now you do. That is the reason we give our bodies, because he gave of himself. We give only in response to what God has already given. So now we look at that word bodies. And you could ask, what does Paul mean by body? Does he mean this physical body? How am I to give this physical body to God? Is Paul asking me, for example, to stay at church the whole day? Spend more time at church with my body? Is that what Paul is asking me to do? Because there it's clear I'm giving myself to, <laughs> to God. But no, by body, Paul means your whole being and everything that concerns you. Now, of course, that includes your physical body, but it includes everything else as well. Your work, your family, your relationships, your friends, but also your hands, your legs, your eyes, your mouth, your strength, your emotions, your thoughts, your mind, and we shall see the mind very particularly in verse 2. But we all know the verse, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. So everything that concerns you, you are called to offer to God. And as you can see clearly, that's not something that happens passively. Um, we are called to do something active. I really loved the songs for today. I felt like ah, they were very in line with the theme. And we sang, I lay down my life. I belong to you alone. And that's all great. But the real test is when we walk out of here, after we have done the singing. Um, then we are being called to live in line with what we have been singing. Which is more difficult and easier said than done. But we are called to do something, to actively, intentionally give our bodies to God as a living sacrifice. And maybe we can look at that phrase, living sacrifice. It's an interesting one. Paul is painting a picture that would be familiar for his audience, his immediate audience, um, the Jews and maybe the people at the time in the first century. Because for them, animal sacrifice was a general part of their regular worship. Uh, even the pagans, they would sacrifice to their gods. And for us, I guess, 
Hopefully, it's a foreign concept. <laughs> Hopefully, it's a foreign concept. But many times when we think of animal sacrifice, we think of weird rituals or witch doctors. Like it's not something <laughs> we engage. Hopefully, it's not something we engage in ever. Hopefully. But because of that, we may not immediately see the power of the picture Paul is painting. But if we go back to the Old Testament, the Israelites, in light of their sin, were given certain procedures. And we find many of them in books like Leviticus that we skip over when we are doing the Bible in one year. <laughs> but we see those procedures on how they can atone for their sin through the blood of animals. So different occasions and different sins would require different procedures and actually different animals. But generally, the priest, for the sake of the sins of Israel, including the priest's very own sins, would take animals, he would slaughter them, dismember them, that's like cut them into pieces, uh, spread the blood on the altar. I mean, an altar is just a, 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 piece, a block of stone. I know many times we say it, uh, and maybe we mean other things, but at least in the Old Testament, it was a block of stone where the blood would be poured and animals would be put on with wood and they would burn the sacrifice and that smoke would be an aroma that would rise to the Lord. So for them, sacrifice involved killing. It wasn't just giving up something. Uh, you find, so I'm going to sacrifice my transport money. Give it, it really involved animals and killing and offering blood for the atonement of sin. And I guess that's what Paul would refer to as a dead sacrifice, if I'm to contrast um, with this. And of course, on this side of the cross, just for clarity, someone may ask, but why don't we do that anymore? On this side of the cross, we know that Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. He is what all those sacrifices were pointing towards. And no one received, at least we see that in Hebrews, no one received forgiveness for their sins because of the blood of animals. But everyone whose sins were forgiven were forgiven in Christ. So for the saints in the Old Testament, they were forgiven looking forward to Christ's coming. And those now and in the New Testament, we look back um, to the cross for our forgiveness. So the cross affected all time, past, uh, present, and in that time and future. But you see, God is calling us here to be living sacrifices. And that's the beauty of the picture because in the past we had a priest going to slaughter an animal. Here we become the priests. Who is offering? Offer your bodies. It's you that is offering. You become the priest. And funny, you become the sacrifice. So we're being called to offer ourselves, not the blood of animals, but everything that concerns us, our bodies, as the sacrifice. And here's the thing, we don't go to be slaughtered, but to live and to remain on the altar. And the funny thing about a living sacrifice, that it keeps getting off the altar. <laughs> but I guess that's the daily walk of a Christian to return to the altar, to continue to be a living sacrifice. So I hope you see the beauty of the picture. But now, how do I? Remember we talked about 12 to 16 being practical. Now how can we live that picture out in our everyday lives? We could start with a few chapters earlier in Romans. Romans chapter 6, verse 13. Paul uses similar language to what he's using in Romans chapter 12. He says, do not offer any part of yourself, remember the body, to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Remember, living sacrifice. And offer every part of yourself to him 
as an instrument of righteousness. So we are not to offer any part of ourselves to sin, but we are to offer every part of ourselves to God. So one of the key things as we are thinking about living or being a living sacrifice is our waging war against sin. So turning from sin and turning to God. Now there's another picture about dead sacrifices. Um, in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, it reads, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Now, with that background I gave of the Old Testament, you would look at this and be confused. Is God being bipolar? He has changed his mind. He no longer wants sacrifices all this time. Why did he give out all those things to Moses? He was wasting time. All he wanted was steadfast love. Why didn't he tell us in the beginning? Why didn't he tell the Israelites in the beginning? Why did he waste their time, their cutting, what ceremonies, what? So, you would ask, what was the problem here? And of course, we don't have time to go through Hosea, but I encourage us to. But the problem here was not necessarily the sacrifices and offerings. If you read through the Old Testament, there were many people who gave sacrifices that the Lord was pleased with. David offered sacrifices and offerings. The Lord was very pleased. Abraham did. Even if you go all the way back to Abel, even before the law was given through Moses, God approved of those sacrifices. So I would ask then, what was the problem with the sacrifices and offerings in Hosea? Here's the thing. The problem was the sacrifices came and were offered, yes, but the heart of the one who was sacrificing and offering did not come along with it. And if you read the rest of Hosea, you'll see that Israel brought sacrifices and offerings to God, but they were wicked, they were idol worshippers, and they remained in and enjoyed their sin. In fact, it's the priests who are the, <laughs> the ringleaders of the wickedness. And so in Hosea 6, God calls them back, not just to offer sacrifices and offerings, but to offer themselves. And I think in Romans chapter 12, there's something similar happen, happening. God is doing the same with us. Many of us, I would say in a sense, are still offering dead sacrifices. We bring our gifts to God, but the gifts don't come along with us. We leave ourselves behind as we carry our sacrifices and offerings to God. I don't like examples because sometimes they may also attack me. But we come here on Sunday, we sing deep songs of living for God, giving all to Him, remaining in His presence. But once we are done here, this very evening, you will deny me. <laughs> <laughs> we go back to where we were, enjoying and indulging in our sin. That singing is a dead sacrifice. We come here, we give money to the church, to SCP. But when we go back, our lives are not consistent with the person that they know a church. That giving is a dead sacrifice. Let me attack our leaders a bit. Leaders we serve spend our energy, time, and money. <laughs> but we ourselves are not seeking to grow in God. We are as if on gigs. We are remaining unchanged, preaching things we do not live by, and we don't even care. All of that hard work is a dead sacrifice. God does not want your singing, your money, or your time if it doesn't come along with you. He wants all of you a living 
sacrifice. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Everything, whatever you do, whether in word, whatever you say, whatever you do, do it all in the name of Jesus. Now, of course, sometimes it's hard to live a checklist life of checking everything you are doing, and we'll talk about the renewing of the mind. Maybe that's where there's some hope, but I think it's a good gauge to maybe at the end of your day, to look back at your day and be like, whatever I did, did I do it in the name of the Lord Jesus? It could be a good check to see where we are at. Therefore, I urge you, I plead with you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. When we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, we set ourselves apart, and that's what holy means, for God. For God to use us for his pleasure. And that pleases him greatly. You know, sometimes when you want to please someone, ah, guys, I, I don't like Secret Santa. I don't know if I'm the only one. I re, I'm terrible at And yet my wife is a very good gifter. Is that a word? So she always gives me cheat codes. But anyway, good I don't have a workmate here. But I'm terrible. So I don't like Secret Because... You, sometimes you don't know the person. And you're like, what, what can I do to please this person? What can I get them? And man, it's not easy. Some people are quiet, so no one knows them. You can't even ask other people. Ah, it's tough. But here God tells us what pleases him. It's very easy. It's like, hey, don't take too much time thinking. You want to please God? He's not just asking you to do more things for him. Maybe that's it's a tendency we have, maybe as human beings, the sense in which we want to repay. We, God has done so much for me, let me repay. Or um, it can't just be a gift for free. Maybe it's the world that has taught us these things. He doesn't just want to, you to do more things for him. He wants you to offer your body, live for him wholeheartedly in all you do. And this is the only true and proper way to worship God. So worship is a life lived as a living sacrifice to God. Now this is a worship service and we sing worship music, but that's just a small part of what worship is. Worship is a way of life. It's, it's being a living Sacrifice. That's what, that is the only proper and true way to worship God. Every other way is false and improper. That's just logical deduction. If that's the only true, then all the others are false and improper. And that's hard to take. <laughs> Because Paul is calling us to something really, really difficult. I would say even impossible apart from God. Everything, my mind, my strength, everything for God. And maybe you could ask, how? How can we do this? How can I offer my body as a living sacrifice? I mean, the year, I started off the year well, started off in power whatever overnight you are in. <laughs> Maybe you are with us at camp. And, man, it has already been a week, but I'm back to my old ways. 
I thought that overnight was the overnight. That's the one that was breaking every chain. But I have still found within me some chains that are yet to be broken. So how? How can we do this thing? And verse 2, I believe, is there to answer that question. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We could start with, the, with those two words, conform and transform. Now, they are similar, but they're not exactly the same. Conforming is a sort of reshaping yourself to fit a certain standard. I looked in the Cambridge Dictionary. <laughs> Me, I don't have Greek, what? I don't know. But English. English, that one I, I, I can find. So the Cambridge Dictionary defines conforming as behaving according to a group's usual standards and expectations. I'm sorry it's not in the slide, but behaving. You can't even just pick that word. Behaving like. So behaving like a certain group of people so you can fit in. That's the way I would define it. But transforming involves something much bigger. Again, Cambridge Dictionary, it defines transforming as changing completely the appearance or character of something or someone. And maybe I can give an example. It's a funny example I remembered. But um, when, ah, let me not say when we, let me say when I was young, sometimes I would have very long trousers. So what you do, you'd fold them at the bottom in order for them to look like they, they are not too long. So in a sense, you have conformed the trouser to appear as if it's not long, but you haven't transformed it because you can pull it out. Now, transforming would look like you taking it to a tailor and someone really changes it, transforms it. So I say those are the, that's the difference between the two. Conforming, you behave like, but transforming is becoming something new. So those two words are different. And what Paul is doing at the beginning of verse 2 is he's pleading with you not to behave like the world, but to be changed completely. And maybe we could ask what does he mean by world? Is it nature? What? Don't behave like the trees? Don't behave like your world? Hey, not G-O-Y. Oh, yeah, don't behave like the things you see on Nat Geo Wild. Don't behave like lions. They are bad. Don't behave like lions. No. That's not true. <laughs> or say, the, okay, the, the, a definition of the world I could give is, may not be a perfect definition, but I think it will help us. The ways of thinking and living in society or in our time that are anti God. And the systems that spread those ways of thinking and living. So, I'll just say that again. The ways of thinking and living in society and in our time that are anti-God. And the systems that spread those ways of thinking and living. Now, as believers, conforming. I, I don't know. I think, I think Paul was intentional about using that word conforming. Because of everything else that he says from 1 to 11, he seems to suggest that we cannot become like the world if you are indeed a believer. We are a new creation, alive in Christ. You simply behave like it. You are behaving like something you are not. From my picture, you are a long trouser but you're shortening yourself so that you can fit in. And maybe that's why, if you're a Christian indeed, there are certain spaces you don't fit into. Um, there are things that people want to do with you or call you for, but you're just not comfortable doing them. Um, and sometimes you may try and behave like them to fit in, 
But the Holy Spirit always convicts you that, my friend, you are, you are, you are a long trouser. <laughs> you are a long trouser. What are we to do then? Verse 2. Again, what is God calling us to do? We are to be transformed, be made completely new. Now, I found that also very encouraging because that's a whole other degree. So there's behaving like, but then there's becoming something completely new. We are to be made new in our minds, specifically. But if you notice something else, unlike the offering of your body, offer your bodies that is clearly active, these two conform and transform seem to be a bit passive. They do not seem like things we do ourselves, but rather things that happen to us. Why? Because the verse does not say, do not conform yourself to the pattern of this world, but transform yourself by the renewing of the mind. Rather, the verse says, and I think many other versions, the ESV, puts us, do not be conformed, but be transformed. Both are sort of a result. You are conformed or you are transformed. But maybe the question is, what conforms us to the pattern of this world that we may avoid it? And what transforms us by the renewing of the mind that we may seek for it? Two things. The world and the word respectively. And we could start with conforming when we indulge in the world. Now, bad news, you cannot avoid the world because you work in it, you live in it, it is in our homes because not everyone in our homes is a believer. It is, uh, for those who are still studying, it is at school, it is at work, it is in our entertainment. Um, it is the, you can't avoid the world. You are in it. You're not of it. Maybe that's why we shouldn't behave like it. We're not of it, but we are in it. But generally, if you walk out of your door, you indulge with the world. Social media, okay, some people are off social I, I want to be like you when I grow up. But some people have managed to cut out all forms. But WhatsApp is also social media, so... Some people are not even... <sighs> even me, Lord. Anyway. <laughs> For some, some of us work on social media, so... <laughs> Unfortunate. Corey, what's wrong? Anyway. <laughs> you are, you'll be on social media. Um, I was going to say, unless you work in a Christian organization, ha, but even Christian organizations, you will be at your work, you will engage with unbelieving workmates, you will have discussions, family, friends, secular entertainment, we all go to the cinema. Okay, some people don't. I mean, not stumble the brethren. But whatever we indulge in, we inevitably are being conformed. Now, I'm not saying we should avoid these things entirely. To avoid being conformed, it's not possible unless you lock yourself away. But the problem is, if that's all you consume, you will inevitably be conformed. So many of us, we tell each other, yeah, that's, that's just music. Those are just movies. They don't affect me. Me, I have self-control. Just a few sex scenes, really. What is wrong with that? Just some few bad words. Have you ever seen me cursing? Really, me? I just enjoy the music. I like the beats. <laughs> Watch out if you, are if you are... If you think... Some people are being rebuked. Watch out if you think you are standing firm. Take heed lest you fall. Now, no Christian goes out saying, you know, these past few weeks I've really been being transformed by the renewing of my mind. So I think I need like a one-week break to conform to the patterns of this world. No. 
everyone who conforms did no one who conf- okay maybe maybe some people did let me not accuse but no one who conforms sought out to be conformed it's something that happened to them because they were in the world day to day they could, we cannot escape it and conforming happens whether you seek it or not however there is an antidote if i should call it that fail to find a simpler word that does more than the conforming you see the conforming is behaving like but there is something here that transforms changes you into someone completely new from the inside out not just your behavior because the verse could say do not conform to the pattern of this world but be conformed <laughs> by the renewing of your mind but there is something else that is happening by the renewing of the mind that supersedes the conforming that is more powerful more effectual that's a bigger word more effective than the conforming that's why i call it an antidote because inevitably you will engage with the world but there is something that does more than the world can do as a christian in conforming you let's go to ephesians chapter 4 verse 17 to 24 now before read as we read i want you to track how often Paul refers to things to do with the mind and to thinking. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. due to the hardening of their hearts having lost all sensitivity they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to be indulged in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed that however is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds similar to renewal of your mind and to put on the new self created to be like god in true righteousness and holiness so i hope you see how many references we have there to the mind and to thinking the problem with the gentiles that paul picks out those in the world is their sin and the way they think now for clarity i'm not speaking here of because of uh, the world we are living in i'm not speaking here of positive thinking because it's easy to make that conclusion that what paul is referring to is thinking more positively about life no paul's focus in ephesians is sin and the issue that he sees with the gentiles will the world is that they are consumed by their sin and their sin has changed how they think or governs how they think and therefore they are thinking only results in more sinning paul here is not speaking about positive thinking as the new way of thinking he's speaking out about a kind of thinking that enables us to say no to ungodliness that enables us to put off our old self and put on to be made new in the attitude of our minds and to put on the new self that's the kind of thinking paul is referring to here and as we are taught in christ as we study the word as we grow in our knowledge of god we develop a new way 
of thinking. We are made new in the attitude of our minds. Our minds are renewed. And that proverb that says, as a man thinks, so is he. We begin to see it come to life. So many of us indeed struggle to offer ourselves, our bodies as a living sacrifice simply because we are stuck in the ignorance of our former life. We have not been taught Christ or we have abandoned the teaching of Christ and therefore we have been conformed to the patterns of the world and our minds have not been renewed. Let's also turn to Galatians chapter 6. Verse 7 to 9. It reads, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. And some encouragement there. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So what are you sowing? Or where, rather, are you sowing? Where are you planting? That will ultimately determine whether you are being conformed to the patterns of this world or you are being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that will ultimately determine whether this year we continue to fall in the same old habits of sin or whether we have a bit more strength to say no to our flesh. A wise man once said, we sin because we love it. No one sins because they hate it. We sin because we love sin. We sin because sin is enjoyable. We sin because we love our sin. But that's the problem. We need our minds, our affection for sin to be changed. We need to be taught to love Christ, to enjoy Him more than we enjoy our sin. And that is what the renewing of the mind is. And here in Galatians, we have a promise. A guarantee that we cannot mock God. That if we sow in the flesh, if we pursue things that please our sinful nature, then don't be shocked if indeed you are conformed to the patterns of this world. But... If you sow in the Spirit, if you pursue the Lord in His Word, in fellowship with other believers, in prayer, if you pursue the teaching of Christ with your very being, you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So as we go back, to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, to our very last sentence. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. A mind being renewed grows to understand and love God's will. Now, maybe not understand everything, there are things that God commands for us to do that maybe you may not understand in the moment. But do you know what you understand? That his will is good, pleasing, and perfect. That he means no harm. That he means only to do you good. And so if he commands, because I love his will, because I love him, I will do. I will obey. I will offer my body as a living sacrifice. This is the fuel for offering yourself as a living sacrifice. There is no other fuel. Now, many of us have real questions about God's will 
for our lives. They are good, they are important questions, and we ask them with sincere hearts because we want to please God. You want to do what pleases God. You want to remain in the will of God. But what Romans chapter 12 verse 2 seems to suggest is that the answer to some of those questions will most likely not come in a burning bush in some extraordinary way. But as we study God's word, he transforms how we think. We begin to see things the way he does. We begin to desire what he desires. We begin to hate what he hates. Our minds are transformed and made new. We begin to see things as he does. And as we grow, questions that may not have explicit, direct answers in the Bible, questions like who we should date and marry, <laughs> what career we should pursue, huh? If, eh, if you should date and marry, <laughs> where we should serve at church. Many of us are willing to serve, but you're stuck on the but where. So many opportun- there are so many opportunities at All Saints. Ah, if you want to serve, there are too many. And maybe you're stuck. Questions like that, we begin to hear God's perspective on. We begin to hear because we have the mind of Christ, his very word. In John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus prays for his disciples and for us. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And that is my prayer for us as a church, as a fellowship this year and beyond. Because that's how we shall be empowered by the Holy Spirit to offer our bodies and be living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to Him. So just like Paul urges us, I urge you and myself, I plead, he pleads with us. God himself through Paul is pleading with us Brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies, your everything, everything that you are, wherever you are, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. For there is no other form of worship that is true and proper. Do not behave like those in the world, but be changed completely inside out your desires, your thoughts, by the renewing of your mind. Then you will surely know, you will taste and see that the Lord is good. You will know that indeed his will is good, pleasing, and perfect. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we come weak, tired, but we still come trusting you, not in ourselves, not in our strength because we have none, but in you who is able to do above and beyond what we can think or imagine. Maybe some of us struggled last year, struggled with sin, struggled with guilt. And today we come, Lord. We come. Trusting in you, knowing that the work you began in us, you will surely complete. That you are able to 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 make us more like you every day. You are able to renew our minds, that we may desire sin less and less and no more, but that we may desire you 
that we may desire to please you, that we may desire to live for you with everything that we are. Give us strength, Lord. Give us strength to offer ourselves, to give ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. Lord, we all have different places we come from, different people we engage with. But I ask, Lord, that you'll strengthen us, that you'll make us ambassadors of the gospel wherever we go, that we will not be conformed, but that we will be used by you for the transformation of others. That you will be known by many because of the work you are doing in us, because of the renewal you are working in our hearts. May we glorify you in all we do, in all we say, in all we think, in all we feel. May it all be for your glory. Amen.